Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hello and welcome to Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at SIPE. My name is Lars uh, Benson and I'm the Regional Director for Africa at SIPE, filling in as a host for Ken uh, Jacks uh, today. Today on our podcast, we are joined by Ryan Musser, Program Officer for Africa at SIPE. How are you doing, Ryan? Pretty good. Excellent. And we are also joined by Eric Olander, founder of the China Africa Project and co-host of the weekly China and Africa podcast that is now among the top 10% most downloaded shows worldwide. Eric, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, today. thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. So we, uh, Eric, you and, and Ryan, uh, I guess, met a, a few years ago on Twitter. And yeah, we're Twitter buddies. Yeah, <laughs> we've been. <laughs> that happens now a lot more. You, you know people on Twitter, but you never actually know them. And so it's really kind of exciting now to meet Ryan for the first time in the flesh. Yeah, I think originally I saw on Twitter a few, a number of months ago, you posted a picture of you in D.C. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you're in D.C. Let's, you know, I'd love to meet you. And you were already off. And That's right. So, so we, we made to, it happen this yeah. time. Though, so it's great to be here. Eric, uh, tell me a little bit about China Africa Project and perhaps a little bit about how did you ever get involved in, in what you're doing now? Yeah, so I started studying Chinese in high school in Massachusetts back in 1985, long before it was chic and fashionable and China was still a closed country and it was really a ridiculous idea back in the 80s to study Chinese. Lo and behold, China boomed and became this big thing and I just kind of kept going with it. Uh, midway through in the early 2000s, uh, I kind of took a break from China and started going out to Africa to visit my brother who was living in Kinshasa at the time. And I didn't really expect to see much in the way of the Chinese there, but there is a Chinese restaurant in Kinshasa that I found in 2005. Uh, as the years kind of went on, the Chinese presence there just exploded. And it went from being one Chinese restaurant to tens of thousands of people in Kinshasa and doing all sorts of amazing things. And so I decided that I'm going to start asking people about what do they think of the Chinese? Because I was reading in the newspaper, in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Financial Times, all of these kind of henny penny, the sky is falling, China is colonizing Africa, China is taking over Africa. And when I started kind of asking my employees when I worked there in Congo, what do you think? They gave me these really textured, complicated, nuanced answers. And I said, that's my story. So I just started blogging back in 2010 and now today we're up to 1.3 million followers. We have uh, 30 or 40,000 downloads a month of our podcast. Emails are going out, Facebook, Twitter. And it's become this, uh, a, an obsession that became a profession. So uh, it's really a lot of fun. And it leads me to opportunities to speak with folks like you today. Fantastic. I was just in Africa. And I have to say that in the last year, it's probably the first time that I've actually started to see when I've gone out to the various restaurants in, uh, in different countries. Um, a lot more, I would say, karaoke or actually African singers uh, singing in Chinese than I've ever experienced in the Chinese last Chinese soft years. power on display right there. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So recently we, we all know about, uh, well, we all know that Prosper Africa is, uh, is essentially helping to define U.S. policy in Africa. Can you share with us uh, perhaps some of your thoughts in, with regards to Prosper Africa and, and what should the United States be doing right yeah. now in Africa? I mean, I think in general, U.S. policy in Africa, and this is not something that's unique to the Trump administration, it's been rudderless for a very long time. Obama uh, barely went to the continent, didn't pay much attention to it. So a lot of people want to put some blame on the current situation of U.S. policy in Africa on the Trump administration. And I'd say this is a, a deeper issue there. We don't really have a clear objective. What we're defining in our Africa policy is more what we're against than what we're actually for. And it started when John Bolton last year at the Heritage Foundation in November, December, uh, came out with the introduction and the teaser to the uh, Prosper Africa policy. And he mentioned China 14 times. Now, admittedly, in Maputo, when they actually unveiled the policy, China itself was not a feature in the policy, but you could feel it in the background. They were talking about good governance, transparency. They were talking about all these things that were clearly oppositional to the Chinese and really trying to present themselves as an alternative to the Chinese. 
The problem is, is that the Americans are coming to the table with fewer resources, less engagement, and a less coherent strategy in Africa. And so by positioning themselves as a binary choice, work with us because we're better than the Chinese, um, I think that's a dead end. I don't think that's going to be a successful policy. In marketing and branding, you don't win by defining yourself against your competition. You win by telling them what people what you are for. And instead, I think what we should be doing is rather than saying, we're not China, we should be saying, here's what we are. We are for good governance. We are good on technology. We are good on private enterprise. We are solid on, on, on communications. And we're solid on kind of innovation, entrepreneurship, education. These are the areas that actually that China is rather weak on in places like Africa. So there's a great opportunity for us to do this. I think the IDFC, the International Development Finance Corporation, is a good start. The problem is, is that the $60 billion that the IDFC is bringing to the table uh, is inconsequential compared to the amount of money that the Chinese are bringing. So. Which, just for some background, the IDFC came out of a, a, a recent uh, law that was passed, the Build, Build Act, Act. Um, which, uh, which is kind of um, pumping some new power into, into uh, OPEC. Um, uh, formerly OPEC. Yeah, formerly OPEC, um, uh, which is um, this, this uh, agency within the United States that, um, that will loan... Um, so they'll loan money, and this is, again, a, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what IDFC's mission is. They're loaning capital to areas where African companies or entrepreneurs from around the world cannot go to traditional capital markets to get financing. And then they'll try and pair that capital with American business. That's awesome. That's what, and that's what African entrepreneurs need, particularly in small to medium-sized enterprises, is access to capital. So again, this is something that is a message that I think we should be building on more. Interestingly, the Chinese now are starting to get into this game as well. So the space on private enterprise capitalization will not be one that the U.S. will own for long. So this is the moment now when we have to really map out a very clear strategy and articulate what we are for rather than simply say we're, we're oppositional to the Chinese. Okay, just to, to be a little bit of a cynic here, I mean, Prosper Africa, if we take away the nuances that you definitely discussed uh, with regards to Bolton's speech and, and, and especially the references to China, <clears throat> is essentially how is the United States going to trade more with Africa? How is African countries going to increase their trade and investment in the United States? And it seems to me after, again, that, you know, if we take a look at the numbers, that really right now it's in the end pretty minuscule so if you were going to try to increase trade between the united states and different african countries what is necessary you've talked about access to capital what else is going to well increase? trade is a tough thing because u.s trade with africa has been steadily falling in part because much of our trade was dependent on hydrocarbons on oil we now make a lot of oil. So we don't need to rely on Nigeria and other countries to import. So that trade balance has gone down to, if I'm correct, about $50 billion per year. That's a quarter of what the Chinese are trading. So the problem is we don't actually sell a lot that Africa wants. The Chinese do. They sell a lot of phones, a lot of clothes, a lot of goods and things like that. So I'm not sure that trade is necessarily going to be the way we go forward on this. Uh, it's going to be, I think, and again, in investment and in technology and in capitalization and things like that. But measuring us against anybody on trade in a, in a part of the world like Africa might be difficult because we're just not buying a lot of what Africa sells and we're not selling a lot of what Africa needs. Excellent. And so, uh, you know, talking about Prosper Africa and, and your idea of how, how to message it, um, how do you see Africans responding to, to that message? Well... Let's just say that it's a hard sell. Uh, Prosper Africa did not resonate. First of all, I think we need to be clear here. Prosper Africa, the announcement, barely got any mention in the United States. I mean, the Washington Post ran a story on it. If I'm correct, the New York Times didn't even run a story on it. So it's not, this is not a priority here, and it doesn't seem to be much of a priority there either, in part because people want to see what are you actually going to do not talk. I don't want to hear your promises anymore. I don't want to hear all the rhetoric. I want to see what you're actually going to do. And people have a benchmark now. Because 10 years ago, the Chinese came in more or less to Africa and said, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And now they can see roads, hospitals, airports. They can see new aviation towers. They can see tens of thousands of students going over to Beijing and Shanghai on scholarships. They can see it. 
So Power Africa, which was an Obama administration initiative, a $7 billion min, didn't really pan out. So the American track record on these things and credibility is not particularly strong. And measured against what the Chinese are doing and the scale of what the Chinese are doing, I think a lot of people are skeptical about the American rhetoric. So we have to follow up very quickly with action. So these deal teams that is part of the Prosper Africa, which is supposed to unify the American administration, the U.S. government, so it's easier for, uh, for deals to get through, for regulatory approval, for all access to capital, all those things. Let's see that happen. But if we show up next year at this time and nothing really has happened, and there's, I mean, it, didn't, it was not off to a good start, by the way, that no cabinet-level secretary, much less the president himself, did not go to Mo Mozambique to announce Prosper Africa. That was noticed. The numbers of African heads of state reduced when they found out a cabinet secretary wasn't coming. And the fact is that every single year, the Chinese foreign minister begins his overseas travels in Africa. Showing up is really, really important. So we want to see more cabinet secretaries go to Africa. We want to see engagement from the president, which I think is highly unlikely. We want to see the deal teams actually work. We want to see businesses start to rise, IDFC loans start to materialize. We want to see access into the American market increase. We want to see reduction of the hostility to African governments, like what we saw with Rwanda last year and stripping their AGOA trade privileges because of not accepting used clothing. That's considered hostile. So all of these different things have to happen in the next year. And I predict that if it doesn't happen in the next year, the U.S. credibility will face a long-term problem in Africa. And uh, in this context, um, there's also a, a new development, which just just in the past few days, um, from when we're when we're uh, discussing today, the uh, in, in Niamey, um they uh, they transitioned into the implementation phase of the uh, Africa Free Trade Agreement. Um, and so, how do you see that um, uh, affecting both U.S. engagement in, in the continent as well as Chinese? Well, the Chinese government has come out very clearly in support of the AFCTA, so the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The European Union has come out in support of it. We have not seen a robust endorsement of it from the administration. Uh, this is somewhat antithetical to the current administration policy on trade, which is a, less, a more restrictive type of trade. The United States currently has more tariff barriers than any other major country in the world. So it's not surprising to me that the current administration is not embracing the free trade agreement. I think that is counter to what other major governments are doing on the continent. And I think it's not in the spirit. So the question is, do African governments look to the United States as a partner? As, and as we have positioned ourselves in the past. And right now, it's not evident that that is the case. It's still early. I mean... Prosper Africa, there was a lot of enthusiasm, certainly within parts of the State Department on this. But again, if they follow through in this and somehow tie up the free trade agreement with AGOA, that has some interesting things. So you can move a good from one part of the continent to be exported into you know, the United States. There is some potential there. And us to facilitate and support free trade as well. Excellent. So we, you've talked a little bit about what China is doing well in Africa. Um, and so maybe you could just give us a quick uh, recap on what China is currently doing really well in Africa, and then what should they be doing better? Yeah. So China, you know, again, we can devote the rest of this podcast to everything China is doing great, and everything that I'll tell you will 100% be true. It'll be a very boring podcast, so I will spare you that. Conversely, we can also spend the rest of the podcast talking about everything that China is doing poorly in Africa. That, too, would 100% be true. So it's really both and. And so this is what makes this topic so fascinating and contradictory and very confusing for people to follow. So on the, on the plus side, China is bringing resources and attention to the table. They are saying that Africa is important to them. They're saying it from the presidential level down. They have been consistent about this for more than a decade since the first forum on China-Africa cooperation summit, uh, so 15 years ago, and they've been committed to it. And that is really, really important. So trust is being built. They say they deliver. Those are two very important things. We're up to now, you know, the last, the last financial package was $60 billion. The one prior to that was $60 billion. These are $60 billion over three years. And now, not all of that is being spent, and not all of that is necessarily 
uh, being used to benefit Africa. A lot of it's being used for trade support for Chinese companies as well. So something very important to remember. But that being said, people see words and actions in alignment. So I think they deserve a lot of credit on that. The weakness, and this is a very serious concern, is this question of transparency and the volume of debt and loans. And the fact that the Chinese are not as sympathetic to the concerns that citizens have in African countries about the debt levels, to me, is a really big problem. So Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, was in Ethiopia at the start of the year, and they asked him, they said, what about the debt? And he brushed it off, and he said, the debt was not created by China, we did not invent it, and it's not our problem. And I think that was a really big missed opportunity on his part, to say that we as a developing country, we too took on a lot of debt. We understand what you're going for, and we will be your partner as well. Again, this question of partnership. Uh, they're not doing that. Now, I don't believe in the debt trap diplomacy narrative that's promoted by the United States simply because we don't have evidence to support that theory. Uh, I do believe that the Chinese will use the debt for influence, and we're starting to see that. So that sense of loss of sovereignty on the, on, on the part of an African country is very disempowering. It's the same thing that fueled Trump's rise in this country or Brexit, and I think that the Chinese should be cautious to that. Excellent. So another, another question or, or related to that, we see all of these infrastructure projects. You, you, you touched upon this. We see new roads, we see new buildings, hospitals. Africa is being transformed with Chinese investment. Mm. Are the Africans getting a good deal? I mean, are when we talk about individual projects and we see the little that we do hear about that might have cost five hundred million, maybe cost a billion dollars, are those good deals? Well, a good deal is a relative thing. Okay, so what is a good deal? I don't know, but one thing I do know is that Africa right now has about a $1 trillion infrastructure deficit spend over 10 years. We're talking about $120 billion a year of infrastructure that needs to be built. They're not lining up to give Africa money. Nobody is. The Eurobond market is at 14, 15, 20% interest. Uh, Zambia's Eurobond interest rate now is upwards of 18, 19%. Sure, yeah, we'll loan you that money. But concessional loans are not coming from the U.S. and they're not coming from, from Europe and nowhere else on this level. So a good deal. Are these concessional loans that have very long interest, kind of free holidays, very long repayment terms, uh, flexible negotiating rates with the Chinese, are they good? Yeah. It depends who you talk to. A lot of people say these guys are taking on way too much debt, like in Kenya, and it's just not sustainable. So I think from the point of view of a, an African policymaker, they're staring down the barrel of a demographic gun that in the next 30 years, Africa is going to add 300 million people. And if they can't industrialize now, by the time those 300 million people land, it will be too late. So this is a gamble now to borrow everything you can, grab the money while you can, build the roads, build the manufacturing, build the infrastructure to do cross-border trading. I mean, the African Free Trade Agreement means nothing if you can't move a good from one country to another country, and that requires infrastructure. So the US and the Europeans and the Japanese are very quick to criticize, but no one has come up with an alternative. So one point that I brought up is, Western critics of the standard gauge railway in Kenya say it's not making money. But no railway in the history of humanity makes money. The New York subway still requires a subsidy. The Washington subway still requires a subsidy. Amtrak requires a subsidy. Railways don't make money. But the economic activity around them does. So if the New York subway was built under the scrutiny of social media the same way that the SGR is being built under, I think we would have the same questions about the New York subway. I'm not trying to defend anybody here, but I'm just trying to say it's contextual in many, many ways. And we have to look at it from the point of view of what choice does Kenyatta have in Kenya? Does he say, no, I don't want this money. I'm going not to industrialize and build out the port of Mombasa. Or does he take the Chinese money on the gamble that it works out? I don't know. It's not an unreasonable gamble in my view. At the same time, in, in uh, just in the past few weeks, we've seen a few examples in which 
uh, deals have fallen through because the African side was pushing for um, either either they were pushing for something better or or they they said no this is not in our interest and each one is a, a little different but there's two Ken- good Kenya examples and, and and Kenya and Tanzania are two good examples of what's happened in the past few months and I think this is healthy for the relationship so in Kenya the China the Kenyans wanted to move phase three of the standard gauge railway to bring it to Kisumu. Uh, and they, the Kenyans wanted to convert it from a market-based loan to a concessional loan. And the Chinese said, you know what? That's not in our interests. So it goes from a 10% interest rate, for example, I don't know the specific numbers, down to a 1%. The Chinese said the feasibility on phase three is not there, so we do not support uh, this loan. And that's why when Raila Odinga and Kenyatta went to Beijing for the Belt and Road Forum, they came back empty-handed. They wanted to make this switch. The Chinese said, no, that's a good thing. That's a good thing for Chinese taxpayers. It's a good thing for that we're looking at more feasible projects, not just loaning money willy-nilly out. Conversely, in Tanzania, on the port of Bagamayo, the, ten, the Tanzanian side said, this is a bad deal. This is not good. And the deal fell apart. It was a $10 billion port deal. These are healthy things. This is a mature a maturation of the relationship that both are starting to assert themselves more. We want to encourage that. As Americans, it's in our long-term interest, I think, that we encourage African stakeholders to be more discerning and, dis- and disciplined in the kinds of loans that they take, not just from the Chinese, but from everybody. And so I think the role we can play is to support African negotiators to get the best deal they can with whomever. And But it doesn't help when... The, 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 kind of the American government and the Twitterati and everybody just piles on and says, see, this loan fell apart. That's the end of the Chinese. This is not going to be a binary choice between the U.S. and China. African stakeholders are going to go with where they think the best loan is, and we want to encourage them to be more dis- discerning in these loans. And I think this is healthy. I'm very happy about that. Yeah, and and there's a third example uh, that's that's a little bit a, a little bit different issues, but you also have the Lamu coal plant in in Kenya. Um, which, that's a funny one. Yeah, which, that's a really funny. I one. mean, it, yeah. It, so the the. Kenyan, a Kenyan tribunal came out a couple weeks ago and said that the, this $1.2 billion loan from the International Commercial Bank of China, uh, and it was a $2 billion coal plant, coal-fired, uh, did not meet environmental standards. And so they kind of shut it down. They told Amu Power Com- Company to go back and to do another environmental assessment. What was interesting was the way that the United States and China reacted to this decision. So China was financing, again, about a billion dollars of this plan. And this was something that China kind of did at the request of the Kenyan government. China was not imposing itself on the Kenyans to build this coal plant. The Kenyans said they wanted to build this coal plant. The Chinese said they would provide financing for it. The reaction from the U.S. ambassador and the Chinese ambassador was absolutely fascinating. And we're seeing, again, this is another kind of piece on the chessboard where the U.S.-China rivalry is playing itself out. The Chinese ambassador met with all of the non-governmental actors who sued the Kenyan government to block this. Took a picture, posted it on Twitter. It was fascinating. Here he is holding Wu Peng, the Chinese ambassador, uh, you know, with surrounded by NGO activists. Something the, we don't normally see. We don't normally see. And Wu Peng, by the way, is an ambassador to watch. He's an interesting guy. He speaks fluent Swahili. Uh, the American ambassador, what he said in turn was, this was a bad decision, coal is a great energy, and he followed the Trump line. You know, I don't know where you stand on that, but it's showing an evolution, at least on the Chinese side, and it's showing an evolution on the American side about where we stand and what our priorities are. And at the end of the day, we're for coal. That's what the administration is saying. And they're executing that across the board. And the Lamu plan, I think, is, an, is, is evidence of that. So go back through the ambassador's tweet uh, history and you'll see his, uh, his quote. Yeah, I've and seen it. Boy, that was fascinating. So, when, you know, SIPE works uh, primarily with private sector actors, and these are representative chambers and associations. And so one of the myths or criticisms out there is that the local private sector really isn't benefiting from all of this Chinese investment. There are Chinese firms that are coming in primarily to do the major work. They're benefiting from these uh, loans. Um, and we don't see the economic impact occurring really or benefiting local businesses. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think that's, I, I understand why people feel that way. I'm not so sure that, the, that it's 100% correct. 
in part because when you're building roads in communities, you're building infrastructure that businesses obviously use to get you know, products to and from your market, your customers are able to travel to you, all different wonderful things happen with a road. And that is something really, really important when you see the, 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 n the numbers of kilometers of rail lines and roads that have been built by the Chinese in Africa, uh, it is impressive. Now, the quality on those roads does vary. So you will hear complaints that sometimes the roads start to break down pretty quickly. There is not a consistent quality, and that oftentimes is defined by the host government in terms of the amount of money that's spent into it. There's a lot of factors that go into that. But it's very difficult to talk about the Chinese, and I'm putting my air quotes up right now, the same way that it's difficult to talk about Africans. Africans are 54 countries, hundreds of languages, hundreds of, of dialects, different ethnicities, religions, all of that. The Chinese are equally diverse. So when we talk about the Chinese in terms of the governmental level, maybe it's not trickling down on the private sector. When we talk about Chinese engagement in the private sector, there is some very interesting research that's coming up. The Chinese are unlike any other foreign player who's been in Africa. Because originally they came in as a supplier. They would send in raw kind of materials or they would send in clothes or whatnot. Now they're turning into both a supplier and a competitor. So the guy, the, the Chinese entity will supply the local Ghanaian market with clothes, but then he'll turn around and also start selling clothes himself and compete against them. Now, for the supplier and the producer, that's a really tough thing because the China price is forcing down profits. But for the consumer, it's fantastic. And new competition is coming into, into African markets, breaking the hold of deeply entrenched monopolies in places like Ghana which I think really need to be celebrated because consumers now are getting choice. We have n more choices on cell phones, there's more choices on clothes, there's more choices on a lot of different things, but it comes at a price. And suppliers are suffering, there's no doubt. But I think that competition in the private sector marketplace is something that should be uh, you know, celebrated for, the, for, for consumers, many of whom are on very limited budgets. And one of the other criticism is that it's Chinese investment is essentially fueling corruption and bad governance across Africa. Yeah, that, that one, uh, I think that's a very fair assessment. I mean, because we don't have the transparency, because of the opaqueness of these deals, uh, we don't know what's happening. I mean, one rumor from many years ago was that the, the, the bribe paid for the Sikomines deal in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, this big mining deal, was $350 million that went into Joseph Kabila's pocket. That was reported by Africa Confidential then. Um, the scale of the corruption, we don't know. We just don't know. It's speculative. I think it's fair to say that it happens. It's, it's deep. Uh, but we just, we don't know because the African side and the Chinese side are hiding behind the, the, this opacity. Uh, but it's probably safe to say that it's pretty rampant. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, from that, I'm, I'm interested. Um, I mean, we look at, um, we, we look at some Western, um, so West, some firms from Western countries like the U.S. and the U.K. Um, who who are now being governed um, governed in how they do business abroad um, uh, it, with things like the the FCPA in the U.S. and, and the U.K. Bribery Act in um, in the U.K. and and these companies when they go abroad are. Um, are held liable for, for the way that they do but, business. But hold on. Are they? How, do you know how many cases the government brought on the, under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act last year? I don't know. Eleven. Not, it's Eleven. Uh, arguably, though, it, it is... I mean, that's not enforcement. Well... I mean, you can have it on the books, but if you're not actually going to hold people to account, they catch the dumb and the slow. They got Walmart, okay, because it was just so abusive and abrasive... I'm not sure we should be putting ourselves up on the pedestal of, of clean government because we're not enforcing FCPA. If we were, I would agree with you. I think that uh, so enforcement has increased over uh, over it, it was dormant for years on the books. Right. Um, and though though enforcement um, is not uh, though there's still a, you know a lot to go in terms of enforcement. It does seem to have scared U.S. companies because because the the price the price of getting caught is huge. It's huge, yeah. Um, and and so uh, it's it's arguably changed behavior um, in how U.S. companies are doing business. Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, I'm not saying that U.S. companies are you know um, 
completely clean in, sure. in everything they do. Um, but there is this sense of um, uh, of we need to be careful. Um, we, we need to be more vigilant um, how we're doing business because if we get caught, there's a huge price. Um, and I, I've heard you say before in in, uh, in your podcast that you know China does business according to the laws of the land that they're, that they're doing business in. That's right. So the Chinese in Singapore, uh, there's been no problems with corruption in Chinese in Singapore, or Japan, or even for the most part here in the United States. We don't hear about corrupt Chinese corruption here in the United States. They will adapt themselves to whatever the level of governance is in the, in the country they're operating. So uh, in, in your view, what are some steps that could be taken to improve the way that, um, that Chinese businesses is, is uh, is conducting business in, in Africa, throughout Africa? I think what we have to do is show that transparency benefits all parties. And, and that's really the key part of it here, because increasingly public opinion about the Chinese in places like Africa is suffering, and in part because people feel they don't know what's going on. So if the Chinese feel that there's an incentive for them to be more open, to be more transparent, and I can tell you from the conversations that I've had with both non-NGO uh, actors in Beijing and then also government stakeholders themselves, there is an understanding that this is something they want to do. However, the Chinese just don't have any precedent in their political system for that kind of scrutiny. That's number one. Number two, there's not a lot of incentive for the Chinese to be more transparent right now under the current U.S.-China relationship because you know full well that if there's even the slightest problem in any type of deal that comes up in this transparency movement, that the U.S. administration will be there to slam them for everything that they do. And I don't think that's constructive. I think the United States needs to be encouraging of this transparency movement. But given how the administration has been so aggressive and assertive against the Chinese, I, I think the Chinese feel very defensive right now about exposing themselves to you know, civil society uh, type of, uh, of engagement. So I'm not sure where we go from that right now, but I would think that we need to be encouraging of transparency and really resisting the urge that every time there's a problem, we come down on them pretty hard. Um, Eric Olander, thank you very, very much for a fascinating conversation. If somebody wanted to, uh, to follow you or learn more about the work that you're doing, where would they go? They can go to ChinaAfricaProject.com, all one word, and they can follow me on Twitter at E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R, e -O -L -A -N -D -E -R, and there I tweet every day about all the China Africa stories, and also you can get our podcast there. Uh, so we'd love to have you part of our discussion. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at cipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening. <laughs>